Okay, thank you very much. Um, thanks to Mel for inviting me to talk and this is good, looks like it's gonna be a wonderful week of talks. And as Mel says, there's very many talks on this topic of SID onsets this week, which is great. And I'll refer to some of those talks as I go. So I'm gonna talk about SID onsets and um, large, large SID onsets. What's a SID onset? So S is a SID onset. Um, what does that mean? It means that the number of representations of n as a difference of elements of this set S, this number of representations is at most one, provided um, n is non-zero. So when I say S is a certain set, this is what I mean. And um, these are sort of mysterious objects. And throughout my talk, S will always denote a SID onset, just to um, set that out now. Um, and I want to talk about the size of a, of a SID onset. So how large can um, a subset of the interval one up to n. How large can a subset of that interval be if it's SIDON? So throughout, S is a subset, a SIDON subset of this interval. So an upper bound due to addition to run, it's quite easy, relatively easy to show that the magnitude, the order of magnitude of a SIDON set of this SIDON subset of this interval has to be around square root the length of the interval. In fact, the constant in front of the square root n is one, plus some lower order terms. So this is due to addition to run. And if you're interested in the implicit constant here, um, I recommend you go and watch the talk of Zoltan Fereding, which I think is later today, where Fereding and his co-authors obtained the first improvement on the implicit constant here over Erdish and Turan, which is very exciting. So that's an upper bound. And in fact, there's a matching lower bound. So there exists a sit on subset of this interval um, whose size is at least n to the half minus some lower order terms. And um, I think the, the record is 0 0.525 divided by two. Okay, so this is, I think originally due to Singer with a, a different explicit construction due to Bose, another due to Ruja. So these are different constructions. They all have a, a similar size. In fact, they all have this size, um, up to further lower order terms. And recently, there were even more constructions due to um, Fure and Kowalski. So I think Emmanuel will be talking about this on Wednesday, if you're interested. I recommend you go to that talk. But the fact is all of these explicit constructions where you get a lower bound for a SID onset which matches the upper bound, they're all algebraic in nature. And in fact, um, Sean Eberhard is speaking again on Wednesday. And I think Sean will show that um, most, if not all of these um, examples of large SID onsets um, come from projective planes. And Sean may conjecture or may not conjecture or may speculate that these are the only, um, only um, constructions you can come up with. Sort of if you have a, an extremal SID onset, let's call a, a SID on subset 
call a SIDON subset S. For this interval, we'll call it extremal. Um, if its order of magnitude is sort of asymptotically as large as it could be. Enter the root n, sorry, enter the half, one plus little o one. Um, so maybe Sean will speculate that all such extremal SIDON sets have to have some, some algebraic structure. Now, what I've written down here, this definition of extremal SIDON sets, obviously it's not a precise definition because um, what's the asymptotic parameter? It's as n tends to infinity. So this it really refers to a family of SIDON sets indexed by this parameter n. But you know what I mean. This is what we're thinking of when I say extremal SIDON sets. Okay, so what do they look like? Well, people have thought about what these extremal SIDON subsets look like, mainly in the course of, um, of, of proving other results about SIDON sets. So let me mention a few. Some properties enjoyed by these extremal SIDON sets. So Erdős and Freud, I think from the from 91, they show that these extremal SIDON subsets are equidistributed in short intervals. So that's not algebraic structure, but it's some kind of um, pseudo-randomness. So what do I mean by that? Um, let I be a subset of our interval, um, let it be a sub-interval. Subinterval of our larger interval. And um, suppose it's not too small. So the size of this interval is at least n to the one minus c, where c is some explicit exponent that you could write down, some positive exponent. But let me not get the wrong exponent. So I'll just write c. And then the conclusion is the number or the proportion of elements of your SIDON set which lie in this short interval is equal to the proportion of elements in the global interval, which lie in the short interval, up to little o error terms, one plus little o one. Okay. So a SIDON set has this sort of random density, an extremal SIDON set, I should say that Everything I'm saying now, we're, I'm assuming S is an extremal SIDON set. So let S be an extremal SIDON subset of this interval, then the proportion of its elements which lie in a subinterval is the expected number, asymptotically. Now, if you're an analytic number theorist, if you see a result about short intervals, your first question is probably what about um, congruence classes? So the analogous result for congruence classes was proved by Lindstrom in the late 90s, um, which is equidistribution in congruence classes. So the hypothesis is now it's going to be not too large, n to the c, some exponent we could write down. Um, sit on subset of this interval. And the conclusion is the proportion of elements in my SIDON set, which are congruent to A mod Q, where A is an arbitrary um, residue class mod Q. That's equal to the proportion in my global interval, which are congruent to A mod Q. Up to error terms. So it's as asymptotically the same, okay? So these extremal pseudon sets are pseudo-random with respect to intervals, short intervals. They're pseudo-random with respect to um, congruence classes. Now a congruence class and a short interval are sort of both examples of sub-progressions. So you could show that um, these extremal pseudon sets are equidistributed in sub-progressions, provided the sub-progression is not too small. And um, so the question one sub s on the right side, no. Uh, 
Um, I don't think I do. So I mean, the expected number of elements in my SIDON set, which lie in this interval, is equal to the expected number in the global interval. And that's the same for Congress classes. So do point out if I'm um, budging something here. But at the moment, I don't see it. OK, so one can generalize both of these results to all sufficiently large subprogressions. You can go even further. And this is what Miguel and I do. We show um, equidistribution in bore structured sets. So let um, B be a specific subset of this interval, be something called a regular bore neighborhood. So I'm not going to go into what a regular bore neighborhood is. It's a little bit technical. Um, I'll give you a flavor of what it is in a second. Just assume um, it's some structured subset of your interval, which generalizes a subprogression. And it's not too small. Then the conclusion is the proportion of your SIDON set, which lie in this regular Bohr neighborhood, is equal to the proportion of your interval, which lie in this regular Bohr neighborhood, one plus little o one. So these extremal SIDON sets are equidistributed in these regular Bohr neighborhoods. Let me give you a flavor of what a regular Bohr neighborhood is. So regular Bohr neighborhoods. So I'm gonna start with um, the unit circle and I'm going to take elements of my interval one up to N and I'll map them to the unit circle by taking a a complex exponential, e to the power i alpha n, where alpha is some fixed frequency. Okay, this is how I'm going to start by constructing these regular Bohr neighborhoods. And let me tell you that a Bohr neighborhood is the pullback of an arc under one of these maps. So a Bohr neighborhood equals pullback of an arc. And that's not quite true. What I really mean is a pullback of an arc and a finite number of intersections of such sets. A finite number of intersections. of such pullbacks. And you can have different frequencies alpha for different elements of your finite intersection. What does regular mean? So I won't give a precise definition. Um, but the way you should think about it is um, integers don't concentrate at the boundary of an arc. So a Bohr neighborhood would not be regular if most of um, the integers mapped to the boundary of this arc. So you can imagine constructing an irregular Bohr neighborhood by taking alpha to be say one over Q and placing your arc so that the boundary occurs at a multiple of, of Q or an angle of one over Q. So this is all a bit heuristic. Um, but just to say this includes um, subprogressions and you get a subprogression by taking this frequency to be some one over Q where Q is quite small. So this is a vast generalization of a subprogression and we've shown that these extremal still on sets are equidistributed in these regular Bohr neighborhoods. 
So I don't want to dwell too much on this because this is a consequence of a more general fact. So it's a consequence of um, another result of Miguel and myself, which is Fourier uniformity of these extremal Sidon sets. So what does that mean? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the some exponential sum normalized um, with respect to this extremal Sidon set. So this is a Fourier transform of my extremal Sidon set suitably normalized. I'm going to compare that to the normalized Fourier transform of my interval. And Miguel and I show that this is bounded above by an absolute constant or an imp implicit constant times some error term. And the error term is n to the minus one over six. Okay, that doesn't say anything about this um, Sudon set being free or uniform. Um, plus something which does measure how, sorry, something which measures how extremal my Sidon set is. Okay. So this is the important point here. This is the cardinality of my Sidon set divided by the maximum it can be n to the half minus one. So what are the hypotheses here? So for the first time, I'm not assuming I've got an extremal Sidon set. The hypotheses are that S is a subset of this interval, um, S is Sidon, and S is not too small. It's a dense Sidon set, say 1% of the maximum it could be. So this is a terrible way to, um, to phrase a, a theorem, to, to write the conclusion down and then put your hypotheses. But yeah, I'm thinking on the fly a bit too much to have done it the right way. Okay, so this tells you something about um, extremal Sidon sets because extremal Sidon sets, this quantity is very small. If you're not extremal, if you're near the lower bound here, then this is a sort of positive constant and you're not saying anything. So these dense Sidon sets aren't necessarily for a uniform. But if S gets close to N, to the one half, then this becomes small and we get some cancellation, some, some error term here. And there's a sort of ceiling on how good this approximation can get and that's given by this second term. Now in particular, if S is the largest um, Sudan subset of our interval, then this quantity is smaller than this quantity and that's going back to these bounds of Erdős Turán and Singer. So for the largest Sidon subset of our interval, this term dominates. And that gives you a bound on how free a uniform these, these largest Sidon sets are. And I think another comment I should make is that this is uniform in the frequency parameter alpha. Okay. Now, going from this statement to these equidistribution statements about progressions and bore sets, that's pretty much a, um, a standard exercise in Fourier analysis. Okay. So the meat of what we prove is here, and this isn't a particularly deep statement. I recommend everyone go away and try and prove this now. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. Such a statement over... Um, the finite field FP. So we're working for Sidon subsets of, of integers. But if you're working with Sidon subsets of FP, the finite field with P elements, this is very easy. And this is an argument of Schoen. And there's some subtle, subtlety in, in what you're doing over the integers because you don't have um, sort of nice wraparound properties like you have in FP. And basically the meat of what we do is overcoming those, those, those obstacles, those, the lack of wraparound. Um, but essentially, the, the, why this is true is if you square the exponential sum coming from the Sidon set, 
then you get an exponential sum involving a difference involving a different set of the, the Sidon set. And for an extremal Sidon set, its different set covers essentially the whole interval in a uniform manner. So you're essentially working with the Fourier transform of the interval, which has lots of decay. So this is a very nice exercise. And um, I claim that, that our, our contribution in, is in noticing that this is true. Okay. So I've got about five minutes left. And what I want to say is um, we're not, in, we weren't really interested in um, equidistribution results, um, but we noticed that these follow from, from this for a uniformity statement. So Miguel and I's uh, original motivation was to a topic in, another topic in combinatorial number theory. So our motivation was um, partition regularity um, over Sidon sets. So let me talk about um, partition regularity for a bit. So before I talk about partition regularity, what I want to, to um, tell you about is a result, a fairly recent result of Conlon, Fox, Sudikov and Zhao. So these authors, what they do is they um, let S be a Sidon subset of our interval. And let's assume it's a dense Sidon set. So it's a positive proportion of the maximum possible size. And the conclusion is that either n is small, say 1 million, or if n is sufficiently large, there exist some elements of this dense Sidon set and they're distinct and they solve this equation, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals five times x5. Okay. So I think this is sort of a strange result. And it's kind of remarkable when you first look at it. Our hypothesis is we've got a set which lacks um, solutions to a certain equation in four variables. That's the defining property of being a Sidon set. Um, and I didn't write it down in the definition, but an equivalent way to define a Sidon set is a a set which lacks solutions to x1 plus x2 equals x3 plus x4. No um, non-diagonal solutions. So one way to define a sit-on set is a, a set which has no non-diagonal solutions to this equation of four variables. And our conclusion is if we've got a dense sit-on set, then it does have solutions to an equation in more variables. And I've written five down and I mean four. Okay. So we've gone from no solutions to some solutions. What's special about this equation? Um, so necessary and sufficient conditions on the equation R has at least five variables. And it's coefficient sum to zero. And then the result holds for any such equation. Now, what if I want to relax these conditions on, on, on this equation? Um, so in combinatorial number theory, often when we've got a density result, we relax it by moving to a coloring result. Let me tell you about a coloring result for an equation in five variables when I color an interval of integers. So this is a variation on a theorem of Schur. And it says um, for any two coloring of this interval, um, 
with n large. There exists a mono solution to the following equation, a monochromatic solution to the equation x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals x5. So the difference between these two equations is one has a coefficient of four here, one has a coefficient of one. Okay. Now does this result hold if I replace this interval, if I no longer color the whole interval, but I just color a SIDON set? Maybe I color a large, a dense SIDON set. Can I conclude the same thing? And the answer is no. Um, cannot replace N with um, dense SIDON. So why is that? Um, take an extremal SIDON subset. Uh, let me write, let me call it S0 of one up to N over two, and then set S equal to two times S0 plus one. So I sort of take an odd blow up of this extremal SIDON set. Now it's a dense SIDON subset of, of the interval one up to N. And there's some boundary issues, let's not worry about them. So I've got a dense SIDON set and it has no monochromatic solutions to this equation in any two coloring because it's got no solutions to this equation at all because the left-hand side is always even and the right-hand side is odd when variables are restricted to this set. So what do I need to assume about a SIDON set to get such a coloring result? And one answer is provided by myself and Miguel. And this is our original intention. Is we assume the SIDON set is extremal. So let S be um, an extremal SIDON um, set in this interval. And then for any R coloring of this SIDON set. So what do I mean by an R coloring? I partition my extremal SIDON set into R parts. And um, the conclusion is either N is, the length of the interval is small in terms of the number of parts, sorry, bounded in terms of the number of parts, or some CI has X1 up to X5 solving X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus X4 equals X5. So we've got a sure type theorem for this, for these extremal SIDON sets there. This equation is partition regular over these extremal SIDON sets. And the last thing I'll say is how do we prove this? Basically, we use a lot of st now standard tools in additive combinatorics, so-called transference principles. And the key input into those transference principles is for these type of coloring results, we need the, um, the set S to be Fourier pseudo-random. And that's what our Fourier uniformity result gives us. And so Fourier uniformity plus transference principles in additive combinatorics allow you to deduce this kind of result. So I'll finish there. All right. Thank you very much, Sean. Our next speaker in a minute or so is Peter Paul Pach.